Welcome, ye brave Friday afternoon few. Uh, I have a large, large herbivore for you today. Uh, it's uh, big and hairy and likes to eat plants in the water. It's because it is a moose. Uh, this one looks uh, a bit mangy, perhaps, but uh, still just uh, an absolutely massive uh, a massive moose. All right, that's that's all I have to say about about the massive moose. A uh, couple uh, couple things to be aware of: the quizzes have been graded, and the scores are uh, in Moodle. If you're on quiz eight, if your score in Moodle is lower than it was on Gradescope, it is because you did not use a recursive function. Um, as part of the, the solution, you, you implemented a function that uh, was not recursive that solved the problem, so partial credit for that. Uh, reminder, the final project proposal due uh, 9 p.m. tonight. And uh, the final optional lab, lab 8, this is an individual uh, uh, lab with three parts. Each part can earn you up to five points extra credit. That's due 9 p.m. last day of class a week from today. Okay. That was the last quiz, right? Yes. No, no, no more quizzes. Uh, you have, uh, you are uh, rapidly narrowing the, the number of things you have left to do for CS 111. Uh, I want you to be able to devote some, some good attention to your final projects. Uh, other questions? Uh, on sorting, uh, final project stuff, anything we've been working on. David. Um, does one person have to submit the proposal or do both? Uh, only one person has, has to submit the proposal with both people's names on it. <clears throat> All right. Let's practice our analysis skills that we were working on last time. We talked about how this contains uh, function would be big O of big O of N. Uh, <clears throat> and these different uh, expressions of how efficient uh, an algorithm is have names. So big O of N uh, is called linear, just for every amount that we make our input bigger, the algorithm takes kind of that much, uh, kind of an equivalent amount of amount of additional work. All right, so let's consider this max function, and in terms of the inputs uh, A or B, uh, what will the efficiency be? And there's also a particular expression that's new here. They go of one means that the amount of work that the algorithm takes does not depend on any on anything about the inputs. That it is constant. It's just a fixed amount of work, no matter what the inputs are. So, take a moment and, and consider. Which of those big O expressions uh, describes this max function? Uh, please uh, have a discussion with your neighbors about uh, how you're counting up how much work this function will do. All right, in this case, we will have a big O of one, meaning that there's a constant amount of uh, work no matter what two inputs, we give this max max function. Uh, can anyone share your thinking on why it would be big O of 1? Jonathan? Can we change the number of steps it does? Like it's always just going to run through it, hit it, hit, and then return somewhere? Exactly. The, no matter what two numbers we give it, it does one comparison and then returns. And that's the same amount of work no matter what those two numbers are. Questions on that? All 
All right. Here is a <clears throat> function to take in a number x and tell us how many bits it would take to represent x as a binary number. And so uh, uh, take a couple minutes and try and think through how you would count up the number of, of steps that this function takes. All right, please discuss with your, your neighbor and you might think about uh, trying some, uh, uh, some specific values of, of x, maybe uh, uh, 2, 16, and 64, uh, and see if you can kind of how much, uh, how many steps it will, uh, with your neighbors, how many steps it will take for uh, a couple of different inputs. All right, let's take a look at, at these inputs here. So for x equals 2, um, we're really interested in how many times the function's going to go around a loop. The stuff outside of the loop, it's only going to happen once. And so if we infer how many times the loop is going to go around, which appears to depend on the value of x, that's going to tell us how much work the function will do in terms of the value of x. So when x is 2, how many times is this loop going to go around? I see some people holding up 1, some, some holding up 2. Um, I think it will go around 2 times. Uh, it will x. This will become 1, and the loop goes around one more time because it goes around while x is greater than or equal to 1. And so then we're done. Uh, how about for 16? Emma? Five. Uh, four or, or five. So <laughs> what happens the, the first time that we go around? Eight, four, two, one. Yeah, so we have uh, these, these five values of x when we enter the loop. I think 64 follows our, our same pattern. Yeah, Sammy? 64 to 32 to 16. We know 16 is these uh, five. Uh, so, yeah, we have, uh, I think we'll, we'll have seven, I think. Uh, for for sixty four, so we had uh, two here, and then five, and then seven, and uh, we going from two to sixteen was multiplying the size of x by four, but the amount of work we did appears to have multiplied by two and a half. And then we multiply by four again, and we definitely less than double the amount of work for that step. Uh, and so it's not linear, because then if we multiply the input by four, the amount of work should go up by a factor of four. It's not of n squared, or, or x squared in this case, which we call quadratic, uh, where if we the input went up by times 4, we'd expect the amount of work to go up by times 16, 4 squared. And that leaves us with big O of log of x, which is called logarithmic. And when we're in computer science and we see log, we typically mean log base 2, which is to say, like, 
two to what exponent would give us x is what this log expression means. And this actually describes what this function is doing because every time we go around the loop, we divide x by 2. So we're going to go around the loop however many times we can divide x by 2 and still have one or more. And that's the same sort of thing as asking 2 to what exponent gives us x, like how many factors of 2 go into x. And so this is an example of a, of a logarithmic function. And any time we have our input and we keep dividing it by a factor every time, that's a clue that it's going to be a logarithmic algorithm because we're not doing like uh, one unit of work each time. We're doing half the work every time around the loop because we're dividing the remaining size of our input by, by two. Does that make sense? What questions do you have about this? All right. Getting back into sorting, I have a mystery function here, and I would like you to consider this code and think about, we talked about insertion sort and selection sort and BOGO sort last time. BOGO sort shuffling up, insertion sort taking each element that we find, inserting it into the place where it goes, selection sort, each time finding the next smallest one. So think about what of those algorithms or not will this code implement. All right, please discuss with your neighbors why you think it's the sort that you chose. Bit of movement toward insertion sort, which I like to see. This is going to be insertion sort. Uh, can anyone share with us what part of the, the code uh, maybe tipped you off to thinking this would be insertion sort? Yeah, that's uh, it's an excellent observation that we have a while loop that's checking an element before some index i, uh, and uh, kind of while that's true, we're kind of shifting things, uh, uh, kind of taking the element at j minus one and putting it in j, so moving things up in order to make room for some value that we're inserting. Uh, so uh, there is have no loop in here that would be finding the minimum element in some portion of the list, which we would need for selection sort. Uh, there's no, no randomness, which we'd need for BOGO sort. Um, so uh, that's, that's where that leaves us. Any questions on this? All right, last one, thinking about analysis and sorting. Let's say that whatever sorting algorithm we have, insertion sort or selection sort, if we added a check to see if the list is already sorted before we went and did our sorting algorithm, so something like uh, uh, for each element, check that uh, 
something where we go through each element and check that it's less than or equal to the next one. So if we do this before we to decide whether we should go and sort or not, would that change our <coughs> big O analysis of insertion and selection sort as being big O n squared? All right, we're thinking maybe neither, maybe both, maybe one of them. So it sounds like a good good time to talk to your neighbors about uh, why why or why not this uh, would change our analysis. A uh, bit of a movement toward A. I like that too. It's not going to change uh, uh, either of these. Um, anyone share with us how you were thinking about this, Gabe? I don't know exactly what it did, but I think it's just taking like n squared plus something, and when you're adding, you're not you're only taking the biggest factor, so it's still just be n squared. Exactly. That's the, the key part of our algorithmic analysis is we only cared about the biggest factor because when n gets really big, that's all that's going to matter. And so yesterday we determined that our kind of insertion sort was doing something like n squared minus n steps for where n is the number of things in our list that we're sorting, and that was big O n squared. And going through each element of our list and doing one comparison, mm -hmm. that's something like n steps. And so, if, as Gabe said, add n to this, it's not going to change the fact that the biggest thing is n squared. So from this kind of algorithmic analysis perspective, uh, it's fine for us to check do this check beforehand, it doesn't change the sort of big picture efficiency of our algorithm, though uh, in practice it's going to depend on do you have the extra time to spend on this in kind of whatever uh, situation you're, you're actually performing this sort, and how many times would this save you from doing your n squared part or not. Any questions on this? So the sorting algorithms that we've been talking about so far are actually ones that humans can and do use when we're sorting things ourselves. In fact, you all came up with both selection and insertion sort as ways that we might sort a stack of cards uh, last time. Today, I want to talk about a sorting algorithm that really only makes sense uh, when we have a computer do, do it, or perhaps if we had more than one person doing our sorting. So I'd like you to take a couple minutes and brainstorm with your neighbors or on your own. If you had, instead of one person, to sort a big stack of cards, if you, say, had 10 people, how would that change your approach? Could you get things sorted faster if you had more people um, and you use some sort of different approach than the insertion or, or selection sort we've talked about so far. <laughs> what, are, what are ideas that are, are coming up in your, in your brainstorming about uh, sorting with a, with a team of people? Ava. Um, I said that if there's like a lot, like a hundred things you need to sort, then maybe having a lot of people would be helpful because each person could do one thing. But if it's like a small amount of data, then I don't think having a lot of people would be helpful. Yes, this is, this is a, a, a great observation. where having extra helpers are only helpful if we, like if I'm sorting a stack of 10 things, the amount of work it would take to uh, like split them up, up among multiple people uh, would, would be, take more time than if I just sorted the 10 things myself. But if it's 100 or 1,000 or a million things, now having some extra, extra hands might be helpful. Other thoughts? Ava? If you put them in to groups maybe so if you knew what numbers you were looking for like with the flickers we know it's like 1 through 30 so if you had the first person collect 
one through five, and then the next person do the next set, which I think you could do with code if you just use the link. Or what's the uh, biggest element or something? So just group them, maybe. Yeah, the, the kind of computer science-y word that's used for exactly this kind of strategy is partition. If we take our data and we <laughs> split it up into different uh, groups or, or categories and then kind of have different people do each of those, that, that can be a way to use, uh, uh, <clears throat> use that, that extra, uh, extra help. Uh, other thoughts on, on how we could do sorting with, with some helpers? So what if I had this big stack of cards and I said, all right, you You sort the first half, and you sort the second half, then of whatever numbers happen to be in each of those halves can be, can be sorted. Uh, and then uh, all I need to do when I get back both halves is have some way of like putting them together into a fully, fully sorted list. Uh, but there's nothing to stop if this is a truly big stack, there's nothing to stop uh, uh, Brian from saying, okay, have one friend sort the first half of his stack and another friend sort the second half of that stack, same uh, with Jeffrey, hands off kind of both halves of, of what I gave him to, to, to other people to sort, and this could kind of keep keep going on on down. So if we had a huge stack of, of cards to sort, we just keep splitting it up, splitting it up, splitting it up, uh, and kind of each person is responsible for producing a some sorted portion of it. So this kind of uh, uh, th this approach to sorting has a name. It is merge sort. We're going to split things up, get them sorted separately, and then merge them back together. So there's two parts to how this is going to work. Uh, the one we'll start with is how do we merge two sorted halves together? So I'm just going to assume that I've given out the two halves of, of my stack. I've gotten them both back. They've been sorted somehow. And now I want to merge them together. So I'm going to merge a left stack and a right stack, a left list and a right list into um, and together, and I want to output a merge list. So I'm going to say while elements remain in both left and right, I'll compare. the first element of the left with the first element of the right. So in a specific example, I have left is sorted to uh, four, six, and right is three, five, seven. And so I'll compare 
the first elements of left and right. And if I'm deciding, okay, which of these elements should come first in the merge list, which one should I choose? Yeah, if I want the merge to also be in sorted order, I want the smaller of the two to come first. And I also know that because both left and right are sorted, that the smallest thing in both of them is at the front. And so if I'm looking for the smallest overall thing between the two of them, I just have to check the first one in each. So I've gotten rid of two, put that in, in merged. So I'm going to compare the first element of the left to the first element of the right. I'll remove the smaller one. and append it to my merged list. So I append it to, to my merged list, and then I just continue repeating this process. So I'm going to make one change to my input here. Then I actually make the right have a different number of elements than the left. And so again, compare the first two, three is smaller, put that in there, four and five, put four in, five and six, put five in, six and seven, put six in. And so now I'm, this while condition is no longer true. It's while elements remain in both. So I've run through all the elements of left, there are some left over and right. So if I want merge to contain all the elements of both, where, what do I do with these elements of the right one? David? Yeah, just take all of them, stick them on the end of, of merge. So it's ever left in the list that still has things left, just they, they're already in sorted orders and they're already greater than everything that's already in my merge, so I can just take them and put them in there. So my last step outside the while loop going to be append any remaining elements from either left or right to, to merged. Does this make sense? Questions on this, this merged procedure? All right, let's put this into code. So, I will define a merge that takes a left and a right. And have my merged uh, uh, list here. And then I'll say uh, while uh, the length of the left uh, is greater than zero and the length of the right is greater than zero my uh, uh, I will then check if the first thing in left is less than uh, or equal to the first thing in right then I can say left dot pop zero get rid of, uh, remove that thing at, at index zero and append it to merged. Otherwise, I want to do the same thing, but removing it from the right. And after my, my while loop, I need to do this appending any that are left over. So, uh, if the length of left is greater than zero, so if there are things left uh, in the left side that I'm merging together, 
uh, merged extend left extend is a list method that takes in another list and just appends all the things from that other list uh, to to the original otherwise merged extend right so here we have it in Python uh, there's a version of this in the notes that instead of removing elements from the list uses uh, indexes which the code calls fingers, so it's like we had a finger on each of these and kind of moving it along and taking the element uh, that we have our, our finger on. Uh, that's going to be slightly more efficient as when we actually remove things from a list, we have to shift things over to fill in the spot. Uh, but this will work just fine for us. So any questions on this merge code? Anyway. Would you also mean to add or length of right is greater than zero? Because what if the right list was longer? Um, uh, when I get to get to here. Um, so I, I think that's a good idea. Uh, LF right is the length of right is greater than zero. So uh, Without that, I was assuming that if there weren't things left over from the left, then anything that is left over is from the right, and I can uh, add those to merge, and if the list were the same size, they're both going to be empty, so adding things from an empty list to merge wouldn't, wouldn't hurt, but I think it is makes the code a bit more readable to do it this way uh, and would not change its, its behavior. Other questions? All right, so far we just have this function to merge two sorted lists together. And it's an important uh, assumption that left and right must be sorted for this to work. If left and right aren't in sorted order, this merge procedure is just gonna sort of put things together uh, in, in some way, but the output's not gonna be sorted if the inputs aren't. So we actually need our merge sort, our step that was starting with our full list, sending half, sorting half of uh, the two halves of our list, and that step was handing that half off and having someone else sort those two halves, uh, and so on. So if we have a function that takes in a list, and it's a function for sorting a list, and it wants to sort each half, and then those will sort each half of those, and so on, and so on, and so on. Anyone have an idea for what kind of function we're, we're heading towards? Ava? It's a recursive. Exactly, a recursive function. That if we have a function for splitting a list in half and sorting it, well, we can make a call to that same function to split the first half of it in half to sort it. And so, have our merge sort uh, with the input uh, input list and. Uh, we're like with any recursive function we're going to have a base case and a recursive case so our base case is always some point where we don't have any work left to do so what's an example of a list where we already know it's sorted without even having to check what the elements are Ava? There's one element in the list? Yes, if our list has one element, it cannot be out of order. It, the, the one element is, is in the right place. So we can say 
if our input list, the length of it is uh, less than or equal to one, because mo we might also get an empty list, which is also already sorted, uh, we can just return our input list. Because it's already sorted, no work to do. And our recursive case, we should uh, sort left half, then we want to sort right half, then we want to merge sorted halves, and then returned merged result. That's sort of the logical steps that we want to do. So we're going to accomplish these with um, a recursive call for both the left and the right half. So I'd like you to take them and then work with your neighbors and see if you can come up with what we should fill in for the parameter to these recursive calls when we want this recursive call to sort the left half and the other one to sort the right half. All right, thoughts on how we would get a, a left half of our list? <coughs> Jonathan? You could slice the, um, the input list, so I get a list and then colon uh, length of a list if I get to. Yeah, uh, and I'll do the double slash so that it gives it so that it rounds down and gives us an integer because if we have we try and slice to index 7.5 Python's gonna claim it can't do that um, so we slice up to our sort of halfway point to get our left half uh, how would we do do the right half Marcus? Um, you would have the same equation, but instead it would start, um, instead the slice would be start beginning at where um, the left was in. Hmm. Uh, I like that idea, that our right half will start the point where our left half stops and sort that, and then we need to merge our left and right together. We already have, we already wrote our function to take these two sorted parts, put them together, uh, and then we just want to return that result. So if we look through a specific example of how this is going to work with a, a short list, 79, 63, 30, we're not at our base case, so we'll sort, make our two recursive calls, and our length is 4 divided by 2 is index 2, so we'll slice up 2 but not including index 2 for our left half, and start there for our right half, and then This isn't quite right though, because we make the recursive call for our left half first, and we can't, and we don't ever get to the right half until this returns. So, still not our base case. This will, again, length of two divided by two is one, so that's the point that we're slicing around. And each of these are at the base case. These are both sorted lists, so they'll both return. And when our left and right return, we then call merge on these two lists. And so they return to this call, but I'm going to keep drawing down. So when these return, we merge, we compare the first element of each, we insert the smaller one, and then we have elements left over uh, from the left-hand side, so we append those. 
And now we have 9 and 70, which gets returned to our original call, which can then go and sort the right side recursively, which follows a similar pattern, where we get down to the base case, return these two one element lists, merge them together, take this, compare the first elements, take the smaller one, insert it, append what's ever left over in the other. And then these two lists are now in our original call to merge sort, and we merge them together using our merge procedure 9, 30, 63, 70. And this is our kind of final, uh, final sorted list. So we have this kind of divide the problem into smaller and smaller pieces, and then kind of merge it, merge those pieces back together. Questions on this? All right, so now what remains for us is to analyze merge sort and figure out how efficient this is. And is all this recursive uh, uh, work worth it? Is this going to be better than the insertion and selection sort that we already already looked at? So we have two, two parts to this. We have our merge sort function and our merge function. So if our, if we say, uh, in our merge function, if the length of left plus the length of right, if I say, I'm going to represent that with n. So n is the number of things in the two list put together. Uh, how much work does our, our merge function do? Well, we have one loop in our merge function, and it's going to go through kind of each, every time around the loop, we remove one thing from an input list and add it to our output list. And so the number of times that this loop, this while loop, would go around is at most the number of things in each list put together. Because once it's gone through all of those, there's no more work to do. And if we don't go through the loop as many times as all the things in the list put together, we append them after the fact. And so at some point, we're doing one, we're, we're doing some amount of work for each thing in our two input lists put together. So that's going to make merge a linear function. It's going to do an amount of work that's linear in terms of how big the list we are that is merging. And so our merge sort is going to be the number of merges times big O of n for each merge. So the thing that we need to figure out is, well, how many, how many merges are we going to, to do uh, as in, in terms of the size of our list n? So if we look at kind of how uh, how we're splitting this up and making these recursive calls. Jonathan? Is it some like <clears throat> logarithm of two because you keep like dividing it by two to split it all? Um, exactly. That each time we split this apart, we have half as big a list in each of those, and so the number of times that we can split apart our input list until we get down to our base case is 
the number of times that two divides into the length of our list, which as we talked about before is log base two of n. That's the number of times two will divide into n, the number of things in our list. So this gives us the overall complexity, the overall efficiency of big O of log n times n, which, because it's easier to see, is usually written n log n. And it has the name of linear rhythmic. It's what they came up with when you have linear times logarithm. It's linear rhythmic. And so we might wonder, is this n log n actually like that much better than the n squared of, uh, of selection and insertion sort? And to help answer that, I made the following spreadsheet. So the blue line here is n squared and the red line is n log n. So the values of n are here on the, the x-axis, the value of n squared or n log n is on the y-axis. And so they're just showing zero up to eight. So they're diverging some, but they look pretty comparable. But if we were to go up to 256, now like once n gets even a little bit big, the amount of uh, work n squared is doing is a lot different than n log n. And if we go up to over 250,000 or even uh, uh, two, uh, uh, a quarter of a, a billion, we basically, n log n looks uh, flat. We cannot see how... Uh, that it's increasing given how huge n squared is. So our merge sort of, of n log n is indeed uh, going to be a lot more efficient. And it turns out n log n is as good as it is possible to do with a comparison sort. No one has ever found uh, a more efficient algorithm to do a general purpose comparing numbers kind of, <laughs> kind of sort. Uh, merge sort isn't the only n log n. Uh, but that is it is, in, is it, it is in this group of, of fastest sorts. All right, it's two thirty or three thirty, four thirty, four thirty. That means it's time to stop. Uh, I hope you all have a, a great weekend. Uh, I look forward to reading the final project proposals, and I'll see you on Monday.